Now, Errol asked me to, to kind of be up and help him moderate some questions. Uh, Errol, if you still want me to do that, I'm happy to be on. By the way, hi, everybody from the community uh, and, and from the ZK Hack community who joined today. Really excited to uh, share a little bit more about Alio and Leo, uh, courtesy of Errol. But uh, thanks a lot, Anna, for giving us the opportunity to speak here. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you want to just get your screen up because then we can kick off and I'll bounce off. Uh, one second, entire screen. There we go. Uh, so thank you all for joining and thanks for coming up as well, Alex. I, hopefully there'll be some questions in the chat and I won't be able to monitor the chat. So Alex is just yeah, going to interrupt uh, me. I'll interrupt you. I'll let you know if, uh, if someone asking, is asking a question. Yeah, I, ideally not for, well, maybe every question, but if it's a bit more important, ideally we can answer them in the chat, but, but I'll leave it up to you. Sounds good. Uh, thanks. Okay, so welcome to this week's ZK Hack. We are Alio, and we are trying to make private applications possible. And I'm going to go over what that means. Just quickly, my name is Errol Drummond, and I am head of education at Alio. And two compiler engineers helped me prepare some of the contents for these slides. And they are Demir Shemeneev and Pranav Gadamadugu. I want to take you on a bit of a journey. There's three main things I want to cover. In the first part, I want to go over how we can derive value from SNARKs. I don't want you to worry about how they work. I want you to see why we should care about them and what we can use them for to derive value, uh, to, for us to derive value. I'm going to do that with an example called Zexi, which is a blockchain design that we are impl implementing. In the second part, I want to talk about compilers, the why and the what. If you went to the, the first ZK hack, you may have seen Circum2 from IDEN3. You may have seen Cairo from Starkware. We have Leo. But in a lot of the stuff I've seen, it kind of assumes that you know why we're making compilers and, and what they're for. So I want to cover why we're doing it and why they're valuable and as a result, when you should be using them. And in the third part, I want to do a little play around with Leo, where we're going to make a game of Hangman. So I can show you that we can do more on chain than just send each other tokens. Then without further ado, we can get into the first part. Um, just so we're all on the same page, snarks are in the realm of verifiable computation. Now, this just means, how do you check that a computer program has been done correctly? Now, there's a simple way to check if a computer program has been done correctly. You can just redo it. If you redo the computation and get the same result, you'll be happy that it was done in a valid manner. Every single blockchain needs verifiable computation. This is a shared ledger, and we want to make sure everyone interacts with it in a valid way. So Bitcoin and Ethereum, they do it directly. If you want to chuck a computation onto Bitcoin or Ethereum chains, the, on chain, you just verify the computation by redoing it. But there's a new technology now, and it's called a snark, a ZK snark. I've got a little image for you here. Generally speaking, you have your computation, the, the thing you want to prove. You have some public data and you have some private data that you're going to keep to yourself. You're going to make a proof of this computation. And it's not a coincidence that the proof is much smaller than the computation. And you can send the proof to a verifier and a verifier can check whether what you did was valid or not using the same public data. There's four main things you should know about the SNARK. The first is that verification of the proof is exponentially quicker than redoing the whole computation. Uh, one analogy is that if you want to check that I did a Sudoku correctly and I send it to you, you're not gonna, <laughs> you're not gonna get the starting Sudoku and fill it out step by step, work out everything, and then compare it to my result. There's a lot of redundant computation in there. You, you can simply look at the result and see whether it is correct or not. So SNARKs allow you to verify stuff much more quickly than redoing the whole computation. The second main thing is that the proof size is also exponentially smaller. 
in the Sudoku example, I, I don't need to send you or you don't need to send me every logical step you use to get from the start to the end. You know, there's a one in, in these boxes, in those places. And when you line it up, it means a one can only go here in this other box. Like, all that's redundant. You just need the end result and you can check it directly. So much quicker verification, exponentially smaller proof. And the data can be kept private. It can be kept secret. The, the Sudoku analogy here doesn't really work. It falls apart because you can prove that you know the solution to a Sudoku puzzle without showing me any of it. Um, if you look on Wikipedia for zero knowledge proofs, there's a great example with where's Wally, where you've got to find the little guy in, in the book. And lastly, uh, the function is publicly known. So if you're proving to me that you know the solution to a Sudoku puzzle, I need to know that it is a Sudoku puzzle. It's not a crossword. It's not a Karuko. You're not sending an NFT. You're proving uh, that you know the solution to a Sudoku puzzle. I need to know that. And these are the kind of four fundamental properties of a snark. You don't need to know any of the details. These are the important parts if you want to be building things of value. And then I have this here that do we always maintain the zero knowledge of the data? I wanted to emphasize this because a lot of times that we use a snark, people give up the zero knowledge property. The reason we do that is that on a blockchain, if you want to prevent a double spend, it's hard to prevent a double spend whilst maintaining zero knowledge of the data. The simple solution is just show the data. You, know, you don't do a private transaction. You can send Bitcoin, but make it public. And that way, it's safe. And that way, you get the scaling properties, but you don't get the privacy. Yeah, so don't make the assumption that because somebody is using a ZK Snark, that they'll have data privacy. And how are Snarks being used? Uh, I want to show you that the, the value derives from how we use them. Uh, most teams are using them just for scaling. We're trying to do privacy as well to enable private applications. And I, I put woods on the slide because Snarks are, is, are a fundamental building block in the same way that wood is. Wood doesn't inherently have any value, really, but we derive value from how we use it. You can build a chair, you can build a house, you can burn it, you can make paper from it. And depending on what your problem is, you want to do something different. If people are cold, you might want to burn the wood or build a house. If people keep forgetting things, you might want to make them some paper. And a snark is the same thing. It's just a fundamental tool that you can use to derive value somewhere else. Now, when we talk about applying a technology to derive more value, there's some kind of implication that there's a limitation, that we can't quite do as much as we want. And this is inherent. When you design a blockchain in the beginning, you say we want it to do these things. And this is what we did for Bitcoin and Ethereum. And it went really well. And, and then we're like, oh, we can do all those things. And actually, it's getting a bit crowded here. We, 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 we've proven the concept and that we can do it, but now we need to do a bit more. We need to maybe add some more functionality or allow more people to use it. And if we want to achieve these new things, we have to redesign the, the blockchain a little bit or add functionality on top. And I want to point out the, the three key limitations that we are aiming to tackle. The first big limitation that we know of is scalability. So all miners are re-executing the entire computation to ensure valid execution. We're sharing a limited resource. And if each transaction takes up a big amount of space, it limits how much we can do. Moreover, we have these growing chain sizes. And like the growing chain sizes aren't unreasonable. It's not that we can't deal with them. It just <laughs> causes some problems. And it would be a lot more straightforward if we didn't have those issues. But we also still have limited throughput. And this is kind of like in the development of computers when we were time sharing. There weren't in the past personal computers. 
it would usually be a university that had a computer and you could go to the university and apply to use it for some limited amount of time to do something very specific. You can't really be creative or innovate with a tool if you don't get to play around with it. You know, it's hard to know what to do with it if you can only use it for very important things. And right now, the blockchains are, don't have the scalability. So we only use them, you know, spend $70 to make a transaction on Ethereum. It's quite a high barrier to entry for creativity. And how do we get to the next level? The second large limitation, and this is a really, really big thing that we're focusing on, is the privacy. Now, most chains are pseudonymous by default. They're pseudonymous by default because the builders assumed that privacy was important. But it turns out that pseudonymity is not as powerful as we thought it was. There's growing evidence that the only people you should worry about can link your pseudonymous accounts to who you really are. And as our digital footprint grows, particularly our blockchain digital footprint, we have to start thinking about these in more detail based on what will happen in the future. So right now, all the transactions are visible and there's a ton of metadata that can be found and used. And I wanna explore this just a little bit more. What does this mean for us personally? Well, first off, there's front running. Maybe you want to buy something on online and you go and buy it and you need to pay more than you should be paying because someone saw that you're trying to purchase something and they quickly bought it and raised the price and then sold it to you for the higher price and kept the difference. And that's something that just, well, sucks, right? Uh, then we have Facebook. Look at Cambridge Analytica harnessing tons of our data from Facebook to make profiles about each of us and decide the easiest ways to influence us to control the outcome of a democratic election. All these kind of things that we should really be terrified about and ideally should be making impossible. If the data wasn't available in the first place, they, it's not possible to, to manipulate us in that way. Just punishing them afterwards means that it's still possible. And that's not something we should really allow. Similarly for WhatsApp, I used to think, maybe you did too, that because my messages were encrypted, that I was all good. They didn't know anything about me. Turns out there's a ton of metadata that WhatsApp can use uh, to yeah, work out who you are. They know how many people you message. They know what time you message them. They know the frequency, how often back and forth you message with people. They know the length of the messages. If you're messaging one person throughout the day, deep into the night, probably in love. They can work out your rough relationships with people. They know the model of your phone, how much it cost when you bought it, because you logged into WhatsApp straight away, uh, the language, the time zone, they can work out your rough socioeconomic background. Now, all this data, and look how they're learning to weaponize it against us. We're, and if you cared about encrypting your message in the first place, you probably care somewhat about the rest of this as well, all this other data. Now, we have an assumption in the blockchain space, an economic mm -hmm. assumption, it's a general assumption, but we harness it a lot more. And this is that you don't need to employ somebody to make something happen. We don't employ people to mine blocks. We just say, hey, if you do mine a block, we'll give you a reward. And if the economic incentive is large enough, people go and do it. So if somebody or some group can go out there and scrape all your metadata from these blockchains, process it, sell it off to the highest bidder, by our own assumptions, somebody's going to do it at some point. And it feels like maybe we should just make this impossible, make these parasitic business models impossible and encourage companies to act more in our favor, to not weaponize users' data against them. Think about the history you're leaving on the blockchains. You know, oh, you're sending money monthly to Coinbase at this amount. You probably make around this amount of money. Oh, you missed a payment. Maybe you're having some problems. Oh, you increased the size of your payment. Maybe you got a promotion. Oh, you buy this very specific set of NFTs. 
Naruto, Naruto, manga, Magic the Gathering, something. What does that say about who you are? And as we can start doing more on blockchains, more NFTs and music, more ownership of things, a car, a watch, uh, a, a house, if, if all of that's publicly visible and could be linked to us, how much influence are they going to be able to have over us? It also is quite relevant to businesses. Again, they can also be front run. They can have things cost more for them because they're probably whales and have a lot of capital and they can be exploited in this. Moreover, <laughs> everything they do on a blockchain is going to be visible. All their competitors will know what they're doing on a blockchain and how many resources they have and how they're spending them. This is a ton of information. And I, I would be surprised if any business would be willing to put itself through in that scenario. Yeah, so this isn't just relevant to us, but it's also rele very relevant to businesses. The last limitation that I want to touch on is limited application runtime. So in practice on Ethereum, your computation can't take more than 0.1 seconds. Now, this is enough to send Ethereum, to send NFTs, and to do some other things. Uh, but clearly, you can't do everything. And there's a ton of smart contracts or programs that we can't do on Ethereum because of this time limit. I mean, we also have gas, and the gas is to encourage a time limit. But even if there wasn't gas on Ethereum, your computation like you can't make a new block until your computation is done. So if you want 10 second block times on Ethereum, the maximum your computation could take is 10 seconds. But even that's not possible because you have to send it to the network and there's other things that can be added and they have to make the block and all this stuff. But there's just enough a limit on how long a computation can be. So that's a whole realm of potential programs that aren't currently possible. Um, this is also quite a new idea, and there's a lot of innovating and creative people who need to be brought to the space to, to make use of this new tool. But one idea is that uh, it's quite important for many businesses to buy and sell data, whether this is patient data to do some processing and maybe work out things for research. But with this possibility, you could uh, analyze your data and make a proof about the data, that the data has certain properties. Maybe the age of the patients, maybe what they're suffering from, um, all this other kind of stuff. And this way, you can check that the data you're buying has certain properties that, that you want it to have and prevent some problems there. How are we going to tackle the, these issues that we're seeing? There's two primary ways. The first, I say augment the layer one. And by this, I don't mean change the underlying layer one. This is phenomenally difficult to do. And we're seeing now with Ethereum trying to switch to Ethereum 2.0 for proof of stake and other things, which I think is a really good idea. But as far as blockchain design goes, it's quite limited in the size of the change. And we're seeing a lot of problems of the sort where it's very hard to change the wheels on the bus when it's going at 80 miles an hour. We got Ethereum in motion, send it on its way, and adding all this community and technology and functionality. And after a certain point, changing the backbone of that is phenomenally difficult. What I mean by augment the layer one is adding some functionality on top that uses a snark to try and tackle these problems. Building a successful layer one is really, really difficult. And so it makes sense to try and add this functionality on top of a chain that's already made it there. It's a great solution and we think it should certainly be pursued. But the other main solution you can take, and this is what we're trying to do, is just by creating a new layer one. Snarks weren't possible in the past. They weren't really possible when Bitcoin and Ethereum were being designed. Snarks were first invented or discovered in the, I think, 80s or 90s. But even in 2015, proving the solution to a Sudoku puzzle just took unreasonably long. It wasn't a tool you could use. It's only in the past few years, as we made a lot of new technological developments in, in the proof systems, that they have become feasible 
to integrate into a blockchain. And we thought that it would make sense to design a blockchain around a snark rather than laying it on top. So this is Zexi, zero knowledge execution. And this is the thing we're implementing at Alio. Howard Wu here is a co-founder and our CEO. Produce Mishra is also a co-founder and is on the team. So we've got two of the authors helping make this a possibility. I now want to go over with you three key things within Zexi to help you understand some of what's going on and how we're tackling these problems. The first is just the core idea of Zexi, uh, what it's really mainly aiming at, that you compute off-chain and verify on-chain. The second is going to be how we prevent a double spend. And the third is where we get functional privacy from and additional scaling, which is through one layer recursion. So now this is the core idea. We want to do a computation, make a proof of it, and then we'll send our proof to the chain. So the proof, remember, is much smaller and can just be verified on chain instead of doing the whole computation. So here's your application execution. This is your general circuit, whether it's sending an NFT or, or using some other kind of smart contract program. And it's gonna take in some public data that's gonna be visible to everyone and some private data that you don't want anybody to know. It could be your secret key. It could be uh, you know, the number of alien credits you have. It could be anything else you want to maintain just for you. You'll get out a proof. And now it's this proof that you'll send to the network. A node will receive it and they can check it. And if it's valid, they'll send it to the chain. They'll get out true, false. They're also checking it with the same public data that you used, yeah? So you can make things public, but ideally we want things private by default and to make that a possibility. And this is the core idea. Prove off chain, send the proof to the chain rather than the entire computation. There's one more thing we need to make this work. Many snarks require some kind of randomness and you need to generate the randomness in a safe way to make the proving and verifying keys. And we are in the process of doing that. I think we've almost finished, but uh, just quickly, we're doing something called a setup ceremony and provided one person involved in this setup ceremony is honest, you can trust that the snark is going to be safe. So we do our setup ceremony and we got proving key, verifying key. Of course, we use the proving key in making the proof and the verification key in verifying the proof. Uh, so this is our setup we've had. I think I took this yesterday, at least 1900 people taking part, which we believe is more, well, far more than the next largest we know of, which was Tornado Cash at around 1100 or 1400. And recall that as long as one person is honest, the whole thing is safe. So if you open this ceremony up to everybody online, for anybody who wants to take part, which is what we're all doing, and you get 1900 people, <laughs> I think if, if, if you don't believe that there's a single honest person in 1900 online strangers, then <laughs> I don't know, you must be so cynical that I can't convince you of anything. The second main thing I want to show you is how we prevent a double spend. Recall I mentioned that if, uh, if you want to maintain data privacy, you need a way to prevent a double spend. And I'm gonna show you how we achieve that in Zexi. It also required that we, we make use of these things called records. So a record, uh, if you know a UTXO model like Bitcoin, uh, this is the same kind of thing. This is a record with a certain number of alio credits in it and some other data that we can use. So this record K has been added to this block beta and there's gonna be a new block made called Omega and we're gonna to wanna to do a transaction in there. I'm gonna take record K and I'm gonna use it, put it through some function, whatever my application is and get out a new record, record N. And this is our transaction M. I'm gonna make a proof that all of this was done in a valid manner. And alongside this proof is gonna be a serial ID. 
you see this record K here, it has something called a, a commitment, an ID within it. And I'm going to put this record through a very specific circuit. And this circuit is deterministic. So if I put record K through it, I'm always going to get out the same result, which is this serial ID. Now, hello? Uh, Errol, if I could pause you one second, there's a question in the chat. Um, cool. Is this setup like Zcash? Sorry, going back to the setup that you did a few minutes ago. Um, the the setup ceremony, I'm not 100% sure on, but this this preventing the double spend, this is the same as how Zcash do it, but Zcash just do it for money and not applications. Yeah, so I can I can actually quickly take it. Yeah, so roughly the the setup ceremony. So this is a question from Zahair. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm sorry if I'm not. Um, yeah, the uh, the setup ceremony is similar to uh, how Zcash the I think it was Sapling ran uh, ran it, and that's uh, using a protocol, a multi-party computation protocol called Powers of Tau. Uh, there are some different. Um, something called optimistic pipelining, and uh, you know, and, and have some other kind of kind of features that to, to update that protocol. Um, if you're interested, we have a, uh, a blog post on our site, and Errol has actually written a great post on our brand new Medium blog uh, describing uh, how setup, so what setup ceremonies are, how they work, why they're important. Um, so I can share in the in the chat here um, some of those resources. So sorry, Errol, to interrupt. I'll, I'll let you keep keep on. No, thank you very much, Alex. I appreciate the the input. Um, okay, where were we? So we've made this proof, and we have the serial ID with it. Now we're all ready to send this to the chain, as I showed you before. So we can send the proof pi with the serial ID to the network, and if it's valid, uh, the nodes validate it, and it gets added to a new block. And this record n is now in inside. Now, in the future, if you try to use record K again, you'll have to put it through the same circuit, and you're going to get out the same serial ID, even if the context is different. If it's in the future with a different function, and you're using it with other records, it doesn't matter. You're still going to get out this same serial ID. Now, when you get that proof with that the same serial ID, and you send it to the network, the, the nodes who receive it will say, hey, we've seen this serial ID before. You're trying to spend a, uh, a spent record. This is invalid. We're not adding your stuff to the chain. And we prevent a double spend. Yeah, and now we can maintain data privacy. Moreover, there's something else happening here. The serial ID, you can't see which commitment it came from. You can't like undo the circuit and see what it started from, which means that by looking at the serial ID, you don't know that it came from record K. As far as you're concerned, when you see this proof here, you know that it used a record somewhere in the history, anywhere in the history, and that's all you will know. There we go, we've prevented a double spend. We've made our, our, our chain secure and allowed ourselves to maintain data privacy. And then the last bit of detail, there's a few things going on here in the application execution, uh, and they're pretty important. So I, I want to explore them a little bit more. You'll have your general application. This will be you know, sending an NFT, uh, sending Bitcoin, it could be playing a game of hangman, whatever, smart contract program you, you've created on here, this is your general application. You'll make a proof that you did this application correctly. So pi is just maths notation for a proof. And I've put a little M here because this proof is made with the Marlin proof system. It's an R1CS proof system uh, that, we, that we use. Alongside this proof, we have uh, a bunch of other proofs. So these pi i, the curly brackets here mean that this is a set. You know, this is like pi one, pi two, up to some number. I think we have around ten of these proofs here, Alex. Um, Errol, sorry, one other question from the chat from uh, David Wong. Hey, David. Yeah, he was asking about the serial ID. Um, 
I don't know if um, if you have that detail, you want to share that detail. Uh, Pratush, I think you're in the chat. You can feel free and yeah. type in uh, type it in as well. I think up, up to you, Errol, how, whatever you prefer. Yeah. I, I think Pratush is going to be the best to answer this. This is a lot more detailed and uh, you, you can find some explainers by Anthony McLala as well, I, I think, go over this. Uh, I can't say for sure. The, the parts I remember is that I think you might need to use your, your secret key to do some stuff. I think I'll just leave it to Patouche to answer that clearly before I mislead people. Yeah, I said it's fairly similar to how Zcash nullifiers are derived. That's Patouche's answer. Okay, thanks. Uh, right, so we have all these other proofs as well. And this is record use and creation. Uh, the birth predicates, what this, each record has birth predicates and death predicates. And the birth predicates say, this record can only be made under these conditions. Uh, similar for death predicates, you can only spend this record under these conditions. And this will be things like, you can't make alio credits out of thin air. Uh, you can't make other things out of thin air. You know, all the things, all the requirements you need to ensure safe running of your program. Uh, so we get all these proofs here. Now, one of the key things here is that this PyM, this Marlin proof, in order to verify this proof, you need to know what this application was. You need to know whether it was Hangman or sending an NFT or anything like that. So whoever verifies this proof needs to know what this function was. But I said that Zexy achieves functional privacy as well. And the way we do this is by verifying these proofs ourselves and making a proof that we verified the previous proofs. This is called one layer recursion because we're proving that we verified a proof. So we, the, the, of course, the recursion is that you're putting a proof into verification and getting out a new proof. And now in order to verify this proof, you need to know what this application was, this one layer recursion. But this is a, a constant circuit. It's a Groff 16 circuit. And everybody knows what this is. But you no longer need to know what the general application was. You can just keep this data private in this new circuit. So we can kind of point out this is where we get functional privacy from. Moreover, Groff 16 is the fastest proof system we know of, meaning that if you make a proof using Groff 16, it's essentially going to be as small and as fast to verify as is possible. So we're kind of doing two birds, one stone here. We're maximizing scaling of a transaction and we're also achieving functional privacy. Oh, okay. Thanks. That was a, a lot of detail. I hope you managed to hang on to uh, a bunch of it. And I want to, we want to look here now at how we're solving the limitations we, we discussed earlier. With the first limitation of scalability, I, I just showed you that this extra, this roll up or recursion, you know, squeezes it down as much as possible. And in fact, this proof is always the same size. So we're making uh, transactions on chain far, far smaller. Uh, allows us to have more transactions per block. It allows a, the, the chain to be smaller in data size and removing execution. Yeah, there's a lot of things we're doing here at the same time. Similarly for privacy, I've shown you that we get functional privacy by default. So you can hide uh, what you're doing. You can hide the data as well. And we went over a few examples as to the importance of, of all this privacy and that it's seemingly an essential thing that we want to have possible on a blockchain. Uh, minor acceptable value, it becomes much harder to achieve. You know, miners can't decide which transactions to put in a block based on what will reward them the most. Because as far as they can see, all the transactions basically look the same. You know, there's nothing for them to go off to to, to achieve what they previously could. Uh, but you can also enable a view key. Like if absolutely everything is invisible, there's not really much you can do. <laughs> yeah, so you can make things public when you want them to, when you want them to be. Yeah, but privacy by default and as an option. Limits application runtime. Now that we compute off chain and make a proof and send the proof to the chain, it doesn't matter if your computation took 
a second, a minute, an hour, a day, you're still going to squeeze it down to a proof and just chuck it on when it's ready. You know, provided you haven't used records that have been spent in that time, it's all good. You can run it for as long as you as you like. And yeah, this is just opens up a whole new paradigm in terms of what's possible. And we're looking forward to people innovating and figuring out what we can do. In terms of the ecosystem, the, the kind of things that we're hoping or well, we're going to be building and looking forward to seeing in reality, we can have a private NFT marketplace. So again, if you don't want everyone to see exactly your whole history of NFT purchases, um, yeah, you're going to want a, a market like this. I'm just recalling, you know, when you're like 15, 16 on Facebook and you're liking all these weird pages and as you grow up, you see, you see these pages you liked and you're like, oh, that's embarrassing. I better unlike that page so that people don't <laughs> see the embarrassing things I did when I was younger. Well, similar for the NFT marketplace. There may be some things you want to keep to yourself. So we need this to be a possibility. There's a private data marketplace. This is what I touched on earlier, where you can prove properties about your data before buying or selling it on there. There's zero knowledge gaming. I'm going to show you Hangman. Um, but I mean, there's no necessary reason why you do Hangman on chain. It's just a fun example. But you can do poker, for example, and many other card games uh, and other topics th uh, that make sense to actually put on chain. You got on-chain AI. Uh, this is a thing where you can prove you have you know, data that when processed through a certain AI outputs some result. Uh, again, a kind of new thing that we're exploring. And then there's all this digital identity stuff. There's a thing called verifiable credentials. Like the, the kind of thing you can do with this is you could put your passport on chain and and then you can use that and not reveal anything you don't want to. Like, you know, I'm British and Turkish, but I don't want to have to show people my passport with all my details of my name and date of birth to, to do various things. Uh, I'm not saying that we're going to have passports on chain in the short term, you know, maybe in the very long term, it's going to be possible. But there's more short term goals in that respect. It could be like a university. You know, I have a maths degree and a biochemistry degree from these universities. And you'll be able to put that on there. Um, another thing is in supply chain management. If you think of your Corona vaccine, like where did the ingredients for the vaccine come from? In terms of the supply chain, you can have everything be stamped where it was at certain times that these parts of the of the vaccine came from these labs, produced under these conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, Walmart did this very well. Uh, a few years ago, Walmart had, I think it was lettuce, and there was some food poisoning. Everyone was getting really ill. And they had to figure out which shops this uh, lettuce came from and which farm it came from and the other shops the lettuce went to. And I think in the end, it took them over a week to work this out. And I think they also had to just take all the lettuce off the shelves because it was too difficult. So what they did in response is... They built their own private blockchain just for uh, supply chain management so that the lettuce in the future, when it goes, it gets stamped everywhere on chain. It was at this place at this time, et cetera, et cetera. And now if they do want to work out the same thing, where lettuce came from and the other shops it went to, they could work it out in a few hours, which means they could take it off the shelf within the day, prevent other people getting ill, prevent various problems. And we're expanding blockchain use cases into that area. Like Walmart did it themselves, but if you're a smaller company, you're just gonna to wanna to use a public blockchain. But also you're probably gonna to want to have privacy of your stuff. There's also voting infrastructure. Uh, blockchain turns out to be primarily a way to organize ourselves and decide how to make changes to things we're doing. There are things called DAOs now, decentralized, autonomous organizations and they're kind of like companies that are doing things on chain but you're automating away some of the things that have to happen in order to do this you need voting infrastructure how to vote and it turns out we can be more creative than we used to be we have quadratic voting 
and the various other types. And this is all the kind of stuff we're going to be building on Alio. And we're already moving in that direction. We already have digital identity stuff and some verifiable credentials. Uh, there's some games being made. Uh, yeah. And I also managed to design a, a decentralized voting system on Alio. So, and I mean, in the sense that the tallying mechanism is done in a threshold manner. So you could, for example, have 100 people who we trust to tally our vote and say, if at least 70 of you work together, you'll be able to tally our vote. Uh, and this way, if you want, the, the only way to bribe or, or allow collusion is by bribing all 70 of the people involved in that in that uh, vote tallying. Yeah, so if you're really, really worried about collusion or bribery, maybe you'll want something like this. Okay, thank you for taking part in the first part. I hope you learned some things about how Zexy works.